team here, and the first uh, speaker is Harold Pincus, um, and he will be talking to us about changes in behavioral health, longevity medicine, and clinical and translational science. So, hi, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Is this thing working? Yep. Okay. Um, and so what I'm going to be speaking about are three concepts that are somewhat different and but are actually highly interdependent in relationship to longevity. Uh, and let me sort of just introduce it. Um, so the three concepts I want to be talking about is number one, the concept of healthy longevity and how it's been interpreted, at least from a U.S. point of view, from a national, from our uh, uh, National Academy of uh, Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, from a recent report on healthy longevity. Number two, to talk with you about the current context for behavioral health care and some of the issues that need to be addressed, especially with regard to integration of behavioral health into some of our discussions. And the third is the concept of clinical and translational science, which is kind of a meta concept of the science of conducting science. Uh, and that I think has high relevance to what we've been talking about today. Um, and so in terms of thinking about these things from the point of view of the, both the concepts and the themes that are attendant to them, um, with regard to healthy longevity, I think the issue is really the issue of aspiration. Um, that basically we're setting out a set of goals and the question is how do we get there? Number two, with regard to behavioral health, the key issues really are how do we integrate that into our thinking and not just thinking but also into our interventions and uh, uh, at both a practice level as well as a policy level. And number three is this concept of translational science which is all about implementation, both in the point of view of the implementation of the research and ultimately the implementation of changes in clinical practice. Um, so let's just sort of address some of those. So in, in this case, this is the report that I alluded to a few minutes ago with regard to uh, the grand challenge in healthy longevity and the global roadmap. Um, so this is something that is a report that came out from the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine that sort of laid out a kind of a comprehensive approach to thinking about global healthy longevity. Um, and it's a particular interest for me because actually my colleague, uh, who's the dean of the Mailman School, Linda Freed, was the lead chair for this report. And uh, also the, uh, the uh, the, the program director for this at the National Academies, we recruited, and she's now the deputy director for my Health and Aging Policy Fellowship. So we've been involved with this, and it has a number of different uh, sort of strategies and clear recommendations for how to move ahead in this area. Um, but I think one of the most impressive things about it is that it also makes clear that um, we've got a big problem, and the problem is gonna get much, much bigger in terms of this sort of demog demographic challenge in terms of the lowered number of, uh, lowered proportion of, of children as compared to the much higher proportion of people um, in the older age groups. And unless we can do something about increasing the productivity and capacity of the people in this uh, older age group, um, we're gonna have a much greater burden on society. Um, and that's coming up actually quite soon and we need to make movements uh, to prevent that uh, and to, deal with this issue of healthy longevity up front. Um, uh, and so basically, if you look at it, the basic strategy that comes out of this from the report is that we have to deal with this at all aspects of life and requires an all of society and life course approach involving transformations in every sector of a nation. So this is not simply a, a a framework for can we ha have a set of pills or a set of interventions to help people live longer, but it's really increasing the health span, increasing the productivity, um, decreasing the burden of getting older. Um, and how do we do that in a way to really preserve um, our society much more broadly? Um, and among the recommendations that came out of this, and I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but an important Part of this is shifting the healthcare systems to better prioritize healthy longevity and to think about what is the strategy for actually doing that. Um, and in that case, um, one of the big issues in terms of shifting our healthcare strategy 
and how we actually uh, direct services for health care is that, uh, and this is a quotation from a World Health Organization report on aging and health, which was quoted quite a bit in that uh, Institute of Medicine report, is that integrated person care, including behavioral health care, and it's interesting that they have to add that uh, in and of itself, is the most effective and appropriate care delivery model for maximizing health functioning and well-being across the life cycle. So, uh, so we're going to be needing to think about that from the point of view of behavioral health. And so let's talk a little bit about what we mean by uh, behavioral health and some of the issues that are attendant to thinking about behavioral health. Because I think the key issue with regard to behavioral health is, on the one hand, integrating it more effectively into our strategies, both in terms of research as well as clinical practice, as well as policy, um, but also in a number of other areas where there's big gaps. So um, just to think about it from the point of view of like just the demographics and the, uh, the degree of burden to society, um, from a global disease burden, uh, depression is actually the number two disease burden around the world. Um, and behavioral health conditions represent four of the top five disability sources worldwide. So we're talking about a big deal here in terms of the implications for worldwide um, health and healthy longevity. Also, from a cost point of view, um, it's been found that individuals who have comorbidities with behavioral health conditions typically have about a 50% higher cost uh, with regard to the delivery of uh, medical care. Um, and think about some, in some examples. So you think about a 65-year-old woman with diabetes, congestive heart failure, and depression. Um, the fact of having those comorbidities is, creates a situation where there's likely to be frequent hospitalizations and rehospitalizations, poor self-management and adherence, and someone becoming an early candidate for long-term care. Or a 35-year-old male with schizophrenia, diabetes, and tobacco dependence, we're talking about somebody who probably is going to have a several decade shorter life expectancy, um, increased medical costs, and significant dysfunction along the way. And actually, Christoph is going to be talking a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, so we're talking about both from a purely statistical point of view, but also from a real personal point of view in terms of the importance of these kinds of uh, comorbidities and the need for better integration. Um, when you think about it, particularly from the uh, point of sort of older Americans and older people more generally, about 20% of older adults in the United States actually meet criteria for a behavioral health condition, either mental health or substance use. Um, but only about 40% actually get treatment. Um, so there are big gaps in our ability to actually address these issues. And if you look just across the different types of categories of people um, at different ages, that baby boomers seem to have higher rates of behavioral health disorders than earlier cohorts of older adults. So we're looking for an increasing number of that uh, people with these conditions. And also, when you think about um, people who have serious illnesses, non-behavioral health illnesses um, at a serious level um, in terms of, you know, people who are potentially eligible for palliative care or for other types of sort of major health problems, about 40 percent of them have um, some kind of emotional or mental distress, as well as more than half of their caregivers as well. So we're talking about a very broad spectrum of people who have issues related to behavioral health that uh, will be eligible to be treated for these things. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, individuals with serious mental illnesses, such as bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, um, have significant uh, comorbidities, have problems around access to health care, have problems around um, the use of tobacco, uh, and die 10 to 20 years earlier than the general population. Um, and also, we're also finding that this comes out actually from like 10 days ago in the New York Times, that substance abuse has also been rising in the older population. So, and when we talk about behavioral health, we're talking about not just mental disorders like depression and anxiety, but also about substance use. Um, so the key challenges in behavioral health really come up in, number one, is thinking about from the point of view of access, equity, quality, accountability, and fragmentation. So in terms of access, um, thinking about it from the point of view of, uh, as I mentioned before, only about 40% of people who have it above, over the age of 65 actually have access and get um, behavioral health treatment of some type. 
Part of the problem, and this is sometimes specific to the United States, is number one, is the workforce issue, um, that we simply don't have enough providers to provide care. Uh, and part of the problem is also that many of those providers don't accept insurance, um, which is a problem in the United States. Um, a lot of them operate almost as a cottage industry, uh, you know, not accepting insurance, having very little infrastructure, and operating out of home offices or um, small offices and solo practices in different types. Um, so that's a, access is a huge issue. Um, and part of it is also the failure of insurance companies to actually address their benefits for behavioral health conditions with parity as uh, with other conditions as required by law. Actually, just uh, about a month ago, President Biden uh, initiated a, cha a proposed change in the rulemaking to actually require health insurance companies to um, meet certain requirements for parity in a much more detailed way than before. Um, and I was fortunate to have been invited to the White House at that time. Um, and that is currently up for review, and it's worth taking a look at in terms of what is required to do that in, uh, in terms of the proposed rule. Secondly, there's issues of access. Uh, in terms of access, we, uh, excuse me, issues of equity. Um, there are big differences in, you know, by age, by gender, by um, socioeconomic status, by minority status, in terms of access and quality of care being rendered. We also have a big problem in quality of care. We don't, number one is we don't have great quality measures, and those measures that actually do assess quality have not improved in the past 10 to 15 years. Um, for example, one of the measures, which is not a great measure, um, it's basically based on administrative data, is a seven-day follow-up after a hospitalization. In the United States, it's very hard to get somebody into a hospital. Um, you have to be very sick. And the average length of stay in a psychiatric hospital is about the same as the length of stay for a, a, a myocardial infarction, you know, about a week, five to seven days. 60% um, of people who come out from that hospitalization do not have a visit with an, out, with, with an outpatient provider uh, within seven days. Um, so they're going from a 24-hour care, very ill, um, and then not really getting connected to anybody um, as an outpatient. Um, and, we have an, and that hasn't improved in 15 years. Um, so that's an example of the kind of quality problems we have. Um, we also have the problems of accountability in terms of both at, at multiple levels, in terms of both for providers as well as um, insurance companies, um, as well as uh, sort of healthcare systems and health plans generally. Um, and so the problem is that um, we don't really have good ways to assure that people get good care. Um, a lot of what is done, at least in the United States, is kind of a, a fee-for-service um, sort of volume-based volume approach, and it doesn't really take into account accountability for uh, achieving some level of quality and efficiency. Uh, and finally, we have the issue of fragmentation that in most cases, and in most states in the United States, there is a real separation between the administration of services for uh, behavioral health as well as compared to general medical care. And so that's another kind of problem that we have. Um, and just to get into that in a little bit more detail, in some ways, the uh, situation in healthcare is very similar to what you might think of in terms of the industrialization of agriculture. Um, when you think about it, that you know, we really have three separate silos of general medical care, mental health care, and substance abuse care, which are often separated uh, uh, by different administrative and clinical practices in many different ways. And it's gotten even more complicated when you add in various needs, particularly with regard to dealing with the social determinants of health, in terms of being effective and being able to reach out to um, other sources of support for housing, for um, uh, home care, and other kinds of issues. Um, so that's added for uh, major, major problems. And really what we kind of want to have is something like the old vision of a family farm, uh, where we can actually bring people together, bring teams of people together, and better operate in a more efficient and effective kind of way. Um, and how do we overcome those barriers? There's also been some promising and more complicated recent developments in behavioral health care. On the clinical side, there's been much more attention, especially for people that have not been very, very responsive 
to the current care being provided are some additional elements of care that are being added in terms of brain stimulation, psychedelics, um, adding more technological ways of providing care that's actually, whether it's telemedicine or applying um, artificial intelligence to our, our care, and also move towards better and more clear direct, uh, directives around what care works for whom um, through precision medicine, either from a biological or genomic perspective or from a psychosocial perspective to actually keep people engaged in care, what is the best way to do that and how do you adjust it individually. At a policy level, I mentioned the, you know, the movement towards the parity of insurance benefits, the development of what might be termed an interstitial workforce that, um, for example, in the United States, we produce 50 geriatric psychiatrists a year around the entire country. We are never going to be able to solve the workforce problem by producing more geriatric psychiatrists. So we need to think about how do we produce people that can actually help move people along the pathway, um, thinking about various forms of task shifting, task sharing, thinking about people who can work in this interstitial space as behavioral health care managers, facilitating connections with primary care and so on. Um, there have been some also some new uh, resources put into the development of crisis management and also what is a nationally uh, uh, implemented 988 crisis number, um, similar to 911 in terms of emergencies. Um, and that is just, has just been rolled out. Um, there also is a movement towards having value-based payment movements that allows for more flexibility and, and a more capitated way of paying for care, but also um, requires accountability for both efficiency and quality. Um, and then finally, there's a movement among a number of different um, organizations that are involved with older, older people to create this age-friendly movement built around the four M's um, of number one, organizing healthcare around what matters most to the individual, um, thinking about issues around mobility, medication, and mentation for older people. And mentation has had a fairly limited, people think that means just cognitive, but it actually includes a broader array of, a broader array of activities. Um, let's talk a little bit about issues with regard to behavioral health and some of the issues that go beyond, um, go beyond simply behavioral health, but actually make us think about um, how do we actually implement the kind of work that needs to be done both in research and policy. Um, people talk about the 17-year lag between, number one, an innovation being identified as something that can make a big difference in healthcare and when it actually gets implemented on a widespread basis. Um, and that's been a problem across the range of healthcare issues. Um, how do we overcome that? What, what are the strategies that can be maintained to do that? Um, and what you need is different strategies, some of which are based at a research level, some of which are based at a practice level, and some of which are based at a policy level. So I'm thinking about it from the point of view of sort of this clinical and translational research from um, these two valleys of death, so to speak. Um, one is between the basic science, production of data and information, to getting it to actually have some kind of human applicability, clinical applicability. Um, and there's a gap there, and how do we facilitate that? And then once we actually have some kind of information about the clinical applicabil applicability, as well as the effectiveness of whatever intervention is developed, how do we actually get it out to clinical practice and influence healthcare decision making um, beyond simply the, pro uh, the promotion of individual drugs by pharma companies? but actually to get it out there in a more um, comprehensive sort of way. Um, and so the concept of translational science has come into being. Um, and at the NIH, there's a whole new, uh, relatively new, it's actually 20 years old, uh, institute that's called the National Center for Advancing Translational Science, which actually funds large infrastructure grants to support this translation from bench to bedside to community. Um, um, and these programs are called clinical, uh, n n uh, clinical Translational and Science Awards. Um, there are 50 of them around the country. I co-direct the one at Columbia. Uh, and uh, basically these are very large grants. Ours is a $62 million grant over five years. Uh, and it supports 
really development, uh, a number of different interventions across the way, but also what's been relatively new for that is that you also have to conduct science about science. So you have to understand how do we, what are the strategies, what are the barriers in terms of moving along this pathway and then what are the ways in which you can remedy and, and uh, deal with those barriers. So um, some time ago, uh, Bill Trojerman and I put together a, kind of an analysis of how this concept of translational research has kind of evolved over time. And initially, it was kind of a two-phase kind of thing, that sort of this basic science kind of uh, process, and then you develop a product of some type. And it could be a biological product, it could be a psychosocial product, or whatever. Um, and it actually has become more complicated. Um, so we moved to a three-phase uh, way of thinking about it, in which we're look looking at it in terms of uh, these three different phases of research. Um, but it's actually become even more complicated as we sort of move from uh, purely clinical efficacy research to actually think about comparative effect of this research to thinking about implementation science. And so that's added more to it. And then to think about it actually from a much more sophisticated kind of perspective, to think about what are the actual very specific steps. And you can see that's taking just one of these and then looking at uh, sort of different sub-process markers from just a f conducting a clinical trial. What do you have to go through to actually develop a clinical trial that actually has sufficient power um, to answer the questions that you've posed? Um, and just each of those steps from the proposal submission to IRB approval, proposal getting funded, leading through the results getting funded. And then each one of those can be broken down into individual different steps. And to think about where do you get blocked in each of those steps? How do you overcome that blockage? What can be done at, from an institutional point of view? What can be done from a policy point of view? What can be done, you know, and also thinking about it from a workforce point of view. How do we train people to actually be productive clinical and translational scientists? Um, and then once you get to the point where you actually think about, okay, we have a product. We have some information that actually needs to be implemented at some level. How do we actually get that done? Uh, and that really requires sort of engagement of not just the scientists, but actually um, consumers, clinicians, administrators, and integrating that and going through this process of being able to standardize the practice elements, develop evidence-based trustworthy guidelines, both within and across specialties, um, to be able to measure performance to see whether or not you're actually making a difference, whether you're implementing it from a Donabedian structure process outcomes kind of model, um, and then use that information to actually change what you're doing and reward better performance um, and to use this in a sort of a learning health system model where as a process of doing this, you're actually uh, informing the movement uh, going forward. Um, there's different ways we also need to think about how do we influence care. Um, obviously, guidelines are very useful, but how do you get people to actually follow the guidelines? And how do you make sure the guidelines are actually done in an unbiased kind of way um, and doing it in a trusted kind of way? Um, people think about continuing medical education as one kind of approach to actually get, and actually most of the studies have shown that CME doesn't really work that well in terms of changing behavior. Um, academic detailing actually does work that pharmaceutical companies do, um, but there is no sort of academic, there have been studies showing that academic detailing that are independent of any kind of financial interest actually works, but there's no business model for doing that. Um, um, and there are different ways by which one can move along this pathway, but really ultimately to think about what are the incentives to move ahead for both measuring quality and also measuring quality improvement. Um, and so just let me uh, make a final statement about it's not just a matter of changing practice or changing research. It's also a matter of changing policy. Um, and so w one of the things that I do is I'm the national program director for the Health and Aging Policy Fellows Program in, w in, in which we t identify people and where people apply for us um, who are interested in health policy and also have a background in geriatrics uh, and medicine more generally. 
Um, but it's very multidisciplinary. We have people coming from medicine, nursing, social work. We have health economics people. We've had informaticians take the program. We've been doing it for about 15 years. We have a, an alumni group of about 200 people. The first year of the fellowship, we had seven people, seven fellows working for the Senate Finance Committee writing the Affordable Care Act. Um, and so it's been very successful. And the people we have are people that are at different career stages. So we have people that are just out of a postdoc, and we've had full professors from Harvard, Yale, Hopkins, Penn, um, two MacArthur Genius Fellows do the fellowship. Um, and it's been remarkable the, the impact that they've had subsequently. Um, and the issue is getting them to be in a position where they can actually be change agents for policy, um, and also within their own institutions to be a change ag agents um, for changes in processes. So the bottom line is, um, given the demographic imperative, um, our healthy longevity aspirations that we've been talking about all day, um, the impact of behavioral health on healthy longevity, um, and the kind of challenges that I mentioned before in terms of access, quality, workforce, um, equity, and fragmentation, and also the very real gap in terms of the 17-year gap between implementation, between sort of discovery and implementation. We basically need to sp speed things up, but to do this in a systematic, scientific way, applying serious, serious effort with regard to looking at those barriers, thinking of strategies to, un uh, to um, overcome those barriers as we move ahead. So thank you, and I'll stop there. Um, I don't know if there's time for a question. There is time for questions. Thank you okay. so much, Professor Pinkus. Michael? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, you mentioned that uh, depression was the number two cause of... Uh, health burden. Health burden. Yeah. 150 years ago, where would depression have been on that list? And what, what do you think the root cause is for it moving to number two? Is it media? Is it technology? Is it two-generation nests? What is it? Uh, well, for 150 years ago, there wasn't a DSM. So that, were people uh, depressed? What? Were people depressed? Um, my guess is that they were, um, and we haven't solved the problem. And obviously, there's a, you know, and, but 150 years ago, there were still the same issues. How much of it is biological? How, how much of it is psychosocial from various forms? I mean, certainly uh, with the onset of the pandemic, there's been a huge increase in demand for behavioral health services. Um, and that clearly demonstrates that it, it, there's a societal kind of overall impact. On the other hand, there's also a strong relationship between depression and family history. Um, so that it's obviously a combination and it's something that comes out of a sort of a, you know, a multi-axial kind of, kind of set of issues. So it's, you know, there's no single kind of thing. And, and you know, I mean, I was the vice chair of the DSM-4 task force and we have been very clear that we have not sort of uh, split nature at its joints, that we don't really have a clear um, sort of understanding of what is the basic underpinnings of most mental disorders. And, you know, we have, we, and, and most of what we have is a kind of a convention for communication, less than anything that's really is based in etiology. I think we need to move on. That was great. Okay. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much once again, Professor Pinkus. Great.